So the media is going through this, and suddenly this case leaps out at everyone, and they go, what? This is in the material that the Ministry of Defense is releasing. Um, and on that note, because there's no point my telling someone else's story, when you people have a fantastic opportunity in one of these rare, rare events in this subject to hear about one of the world's most sensational and interesting UFO cases, not, and no disrespect to the researchers and the ufologists and the journalists, but not from somebody else writing up somebody else's story, but from the man himself. Um, my co-speaker today, uh, Dr. Milton Torres, a retired USAF uh, major, 20, 20 years service uh, for his country, doctorate in, in mechanical engineering, taught at Florida International University, a man who has served his country with distinction and honor, um, who has not particularly wanted, because he was asked not to talk about this, and it was only when the Ministry of Defense effectively outed him and put his name into the public domain um, that, that, you know, we're in a situation where, okay, if the government is now releasing this and it's in the file, I guess I can talk about this. So without uh, any further ado uh, from myself, I would like now to hand over to Major Milton Torres. I hope you can hear me. <clears throat> this man just saved my life. The MOD released the story that I've kept since 1957. <laughs> what a relief. I can talk about it. I'll, I'll give you a background about where I came from and how I started. I joined the Air Force because the Korean War was on and my number was getting close. And I certainly didn't want to go to the Army and I don't like mud. And, and I just sure, sure as hell wanted to be a firefighter. And I knew I wasn't going to be one because I didn't have any education at that time. But anyway, I joined the Air Force. And lo and behold, they come down and say, we offer to the enlisted personnel a chance to fly. Wow. I, I succeeded. I, I was well up in the, in the top of the class. I wasn't the top, but I was close. And they offered me a fighter job. It was an F-86. But an F-86, not for Korea, it was an 86D, an all-weather airplane to shoot down bombers that were coming in. Anyway, make a long story short, we were assigned to the 514th Fighter Interceptor Squadron, one of the three squadrons of the wing. And this were all stationed at RAF Station Manson, except we had one squadron up at Bentwaters. And uh, it eventually went to Schusterberg, I think it was, but wherever it went, didn't matter, that was after. We got so well proficient with rocketry that they made us what they call combat ready. When we went back to England, we, they d decided that the 514th and the, and the 513th, that's just a squadron on the base, were combat ready, and we would take our share of the load for alerts. Now, we shared that alert with the British, the RAF. Now, in the case of Manston, first of all, let me explain. Manston is on the Thames Estuary on the tip, just north of Dover, but on the Thames Estuary. And we, were, we could see England, I mean France, uh, about, about 18 miles on a clear day, which wasn't very often. But uh, we could see it. So we decided to, to set up shop on the end of the runway on the side. Now, Manston has a 750 foot wide runway. It was made for recovery of bombers that were shot up during the war. And boy, they had plenty of, they had a FIDO system, they had everything that you could possibly have. The FIDO system was, would burn the fog off. It would lift, lift the fog up three, four hundred feet. That, that gave you a hell of a lot of visibility. So it was really the perfect base for an all-weather fighter. 
Anyway, sure enough, we got the clocks in the, the, the scramble order. They said, get to your planes, get airborne, and check in on whatever the frequency was. It's not important. Uh, uh, Roger, we got. We, were, we beat that five minutes in about three minutes at least. And we were on the end of the runway. I was taking off. I was no, long, no sooner got airborne. Now, mind you, we took off as a formation of two, but we, because of our tactics uh, in radar, one drops behind the other, and we go in line. And then when, at the, at, as we reach the, 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 the target, whatever the target is, we turn in place so that both of us have a chance to fire on the same thing. Well, at any rate, when I checked into the GCI, this is, I have some information for you. I said, I hope so. He says, you are, gonna, you are ordered to fire on this object. It's a UFO that's orbiting Ipswich and Norwich, which is in East Anglia. And it, it's just stationary sometimes. We don't understand it. It's at Angels 320. So and it's at Go Gate, which means you, you have to burn it. Just go get them. He said, I'll give you a, an intern, and you, uh, you'll have a, on your port side at 30 degrees, somewhere around 15 miles away, you'll have your target. Sure enough, just like he said, we turned. I saw a blip that was as big as the blips I saw. So when I'd see an aircraft carrier on the, in the North Sea, and the radar was so sensitive that it was like a blob of light. It, it, was, it wasn't a point, it was a blob. So when I ran my range gate marker up to this blip, it just seemed to lock on and turn all the lights off. It just, it was such a strong lock on that the, the, the airplane was telling me where to go. I mean, just in every way. So sure enough, I called Judy, and that, that was the symbol that we use for GCI and say, you don't need to give me any more information, I'm locked up, and that my radar will take me into for this thing. Well, I was still at 0.92 and fuel was going down fast. And I said, I want, I want to come out of the afterburner. I said, no, stay in afterburner. I was really worried about my fuel. <coughs> anyway, they, were, they denied that. They wanted me to get this thing down. So uh, as I was going in, I got this lock on and I had overtakes that were very high. I was going 0.92 Mach, which is uh, 90 point, that's 92% of Mach 1, which is very fast, very close to 700 miles an hour. At any rate, when I locked on, that it was such a strong lock with strong information. I was getting all kinds of information from, from my radar. It was telling me everything. So I called Judy and, and started going in on the, on the thing, and he, was, he, he still had to tell me some more. Uh, he said, right ahead, just keep going, you're on the way. I said, I know that. <coughs> anyway, when I got uh, my 20 seconds to go, the, the, the circle starts shrinking. On the, sh on the circle, you have overtake speed. Uh, the overtake was indicating I was going po 0.92, and this thing was probably pretty near steel still because he wasn't moving, because it was about that, that much closure speed. As I was getting closer, uh, I noticed that my, my radar was basically so damn strong that I could see all the lights that were coming on. And what, what was going on was he had decided to get the hell out of there. And he, when he got out of there, he went Mach 10 or something. It was beyond anything I could measure. So, I mean, he left me just standing there. And he was gone. And this happened in oh, maybe one or two seconds. And, and at my speed, there's nothing I could do. That was it. It was all over for me. I told all the radar people. I said, G GCI, I said, what's happening with this bogey? He says, I'm sorry, sir, but he's off our screen. He has a 250-mile range scope, and he was already off of that screen as well. So I said, oh, there's nothing I can do. I can't do anything except fire rockets, and then they'll land an Ipswich, and I don't want to do anything like that. So he said, well, you released a home plate, meaning I could go home. On the way home, they called me and said, 
when you get on the ground, call me on the landline. I've got to give you a briefing. I said, Roger, I'd like to know what the hell happened too. So anyway, I got on the ground. I called them. At, this med sector was RAF com control. This is the MOD that, that called the shots. And at any rate, they said, this mission has been declared top secret. And you're not to mention this to anyone, not your commander, not your wife, not anybody. Mum's the word, you didn't fly this mission. You understand? I said, yes, sir, I understand. He said, now we're sending somebody down from the embassy to debrief you. Uh, what they meant is they're sending me a spook. A spook is what we used to call these people that come from the cloak and dagger and debrief you and you know, tell you that you're in jeopardy of anything if you do anything. So when I got down there, uh, the next morning, the spook showed up. I didn't see him. Uh, an innocent man that has been in contact with me since because he didn't know about the mission either. But nobody knew about the mission until the MOD released it in October 21st of last year. When they released it, it just took all the weight off my shoulder. And that, now I could talk to anybody. So Ron, I talked to Ron, Ron Kane, who's an enlisted man. He was one of two twins. One of them passed away. Both of them were in our operations. And he, uh, he said, hey, I took that guy back to you. I said, I didn't know anybody knew about him. He came and went like, like, a, like a spook. You know, like nobody saw him. So he said, yeah, I saw him. I, I can tell you all you want to know about him. I said, I want to know, I want to know where he was from. He said, we don't know. I, I thank you very much. <laughs> so I, but I knew when he held up that USA document that he had, that it was the American Eagle, and it, and it was that I should shut up. And he told me, this is not only top secret. If you open your mouth about this to anyone, whether it be your commander or anyone else, we will pr take you away from flying for the rest of your career. And I just didn't, couldn't see that. So I jammed my, my two lips together and never said another word. And I left Manston. All my fighter buddies would love to have heard the story. And I would love to have told them, but I couldn't tell them. So I never said another word until the MOD has released it. Now I can talk to them about it. It's about time. That was the end of my mission. That was the end of my year. But I'm going to tell you right now, I have convinced myself that this was an alien spacecraft because he did things that my airplane couldn't do or no other airplane could do. And he had speeds that were infinite compared to what I could handle. And I think he had a propulsion system that was at, it, it controlled anti-gravity or something because he just took off. I don't know how the hell he did it without being plastered up against the ceiling because there were G-forces going on there that I, I couldn't even imagine. So I have been convinced since then that was an alien and nobody's going to talk me out of that one. I did it myself. And I thank you for your... Well, ladies and gentlemen, I really don't know how you can follow an, an account like that. You have just been privileged to sit through a first-person description of arguably one of the most interesting UFO cases that I've ever heard about. Um, 1957, bear in mind we're talking about. A radar return showing a craft the size of an aircraft carrier capable of hovering at one moment and then accelerating away at speeds of Mach 10 at the next. I, I sure as heck don't know what that could be. Uh, it certainly wasn't one of ours. I wish it was. Um, absolutely extraordinary. Uh, the interesting thing is there's a wider issue here. Um, there have been other cases where serving military pilots, having received authorization from the chain of command have been given a shoot down order. Um, I think Richard Dolan touched yesterday very briefly on the case of Parviz Jafari, 
um, from Iran in 1976 who was ordered to shoot down a UFO in the vicinity of Tehran. Um, when he closed on the object, uh, everything else in his airplane worked, but I, I think it was his fire control system, his, his uh, air-to-air missile firing capability uh, just winked out. Um, Parviz Jafari retired as a general. There are generals out there willing to talk about the UFO issue and about first-person experiences. Um, another case is Comandante Huertas uh, from uh, Peru, 1980, uh, in December. He was scrambled, authorized to open fire on a UFO that had infringed into restricted military airspace. He actually did manage to open fire with his machine cannon. Um, his testimony was that the rounds were somehow absorbed by the UFO. Uh, he said, I didn't miss. You know, like all, all fighter pilots, proud men, he said, I didn't miss. You know, <laughs> nor did I see the rounds ricochet off this thing. They were absorbed. He said, that's the only word I can, can use. 